Once again, it's good to see you, and today, many, many years ago, about 2,000 years ago, symbolizes the time that Jesus Christ was uh, crucified, when he died on the cross for the sake of mankind and for the sake of the world. Good Friday marks the day when Jesus was crucified by the Romans in Jerusalem. And when he was condemned by Jewish religious leaders. And Jesus was sentenced to crucifixion by Pontius Pilate, who was a Roman leader. Jesus was publicly beaten and forced to carry a heavy wooden cross through the streets before being nailed to the cross where he died. This really is the ultimate symbol of giving. And I say so because this month we've been going through a series on giving. And today in particular, we are looking at giving for eternity giving for eternity so for God just to send his one and only son just to give him to come and die on the cross for us this really is the symbol of giving God is the ultimate giver and God gives generously God gives without sparing even his very best, and that is his son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. God gives and God gave for the sake of eternity. And we look at that topic, giving for eternity, from what Pastor Praise has read for us very well, from the book of John, chapter 3, from verse 13 to verse 18. But the context comes from the larger chapter 3, where we are told of Nicodemus. And you find that in verse 1, where the Bible says that now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, and that he was a member of the Jewish ruling council. What that tells you is that Nicodemus was conversant with the matters of the law or matters of scripture. He had done that religiously as a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee, even a member of the ruling council. And then we are told that he told Jesus, we know you are a teacher. In fact, he says, he came to Jesus at night. I don't know why he did it at night. Uh, and he said, uh, Maybe at night because looking at his confession and looking at how he talks to Jesus is somehow contrary to how the other Pharisees saw Jesus. So maybe it's because of that, that secretly he went to Jesus at night and said, Teacher or Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God. And this is the confession that he makes. For no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. He had seen what Jesus was doing, what the Lord was allowing Jesus to do. And he makes that confession. And Jesus replies by saying, I tell you the truth. 
that no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. And Nicodemus is taken aback. And the conversation goes, and, and he asks, how is it possible that once someone is born again, they can go back into their mother's womb? And then be born again. Once someone is born, that they can go back into their mother's womb. And then he can be born again. And Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. No one can enter the kingdom of God unless he's born again. And unless he's born of water and that of the spirit. He says, flesh gives birth to flesh. But the spirit gives birth to the spirit. And he continues to ask in verse 9, how can this be? And you find a reply again of Jesus Christ saying, you are Israel's teacher, Jesus said. And do you not understand these things? I tell you the truth, we speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen. But till you people do not accept. I have, I tell you the truth again. We speak of what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but still you people do not accept our testimony. I have spoken to you of earthly things and you do not believe. How then will you believe if I speak to you heavenly things. And that really summary constitutes this whole idea about giving for eternity. And that is what he continues to expound in the rest of the scriptures. To a large extent, God saw the predicament of man and God said, man cannot get out of this, and we'll be looking at it in detail a little later. And for that which God saw, he gave, and he gave his one and only son. But when God gave his son, it was a matter of reconciliation. It was a matter of not wanting man to be eternally condemned, but wanting man to have eternal life. And God did not spare anything for the sake of eternity. God gave his best. God gave his one and only son. If you prefer, God gave his all. And for that giving for eternity to take effect, I see that yes, he gave his son. But in the giving of his son, there are underlying principles that I want us to look at in point form. Number one is that for that giving for the sake of eternity to take effect, then Jesus was given, number one, as a substitute for our sins. Jesus was given as a substitute for our sins. Number two, for that giving for eternity to take effect, Jesus was given as a sacrifice for our sin. Jesus was given as a sacrifice for our sin. Number three is that for that giving for the sake of eternity to take effect, Jesus was given as a savior for mankind. Jesus was given as a savior for mankind. Let's begin with the first one. Jesus was given as a substitute for our sin. And largely you find that between verse 13 and verse 15. And the Bible says, no one has ever gone into heaven except the one who came from heaven, the son of man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that every
everyone who believes in him being lifted up, then their sin becomes substituted because of him being lifted and therefore they can have eternal life. Jesus came as a substitute. You know, the word substitute means primarily taking the place of another. The closest explanation that may come to mind is take, for example, soccer or football in this part of the world. And you have your 11 players playing. And sometimes as they play, some may get injured. Some may not play as originally planned. Some may get tired. And then there is a word that is normally coined, substitute, so that they are replaced, so that the team can continue to do better and to play well. So the one that is a little stronger comes to take the place of the one that is most likely injured, had a knock on the knee, or a little tired, or maybe overwhelmed by the entire game. And the one that has come to substitute them gives sometimes another strength to the team in the football world if there are those that are consistently coming and scoring and doing so well and encouraging the team to do well, there's even a word that has been coined for them. They are called super subs. That is the meaning of the word substitute. Maybe another way to explain it is this piracy thing that you see in the seas. So when the captives, they come and they take a ship captive together with the people in the ship, what do they normally do? They ask for some money to be given so that they can release the people that have taken captives. Sometimes we call it a ransom. And that is a substitute that we are talking about. That when Adam and Eve fell into sin, there was no other way but there was a penalty that was to be paid. And man could try in his own efforts, but he could not. And therefore, God sends a substitute. <laughs> Allow me to use a super, super, super substitute. For your sake and for my sake, that is what giving for eternity is all about. When Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, there was no other way out but to pay for the penalty of sin. But remember, because they had already sinned, they could not get out because that penalty needed a perfect payment. They were held captive. They were held hostage by sin because after that we are all born sinners. For the Bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And therefore cannot come out by their own strength. According to the scriptures, sin must be paid for. When Jesus Christ died, he suffered as a substitute. In the place of and on behalf of the fallen humanity. Christ's death made it possible for men and women to be declared righteous based on their faith in him. And it is in that faith in him that he becomes a substitute. And he becomes a perfect substitute. He becomes a pure substitute. He becomes a precious substitute. For the Bible says, just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many, so that he can die in your place. He can, play, he can pay that penalty for you, and he can pay that penalty for me. Oh, Paul writing to the Corinthians says, God made him who had no sin, 
to become sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. For a man to be redeemed, a man had to die. However, not just any man who will do. The one who died would have to be a perfect man. One without sin and without any wickedness. God knows our need and God knows our inability to do anything about it ourselves. That we cannot do anything about sin ourselves. And therefore, he provided a perfect substitute. He gave us none other than his one and only son, Jesus Christ. When Jesus was on the cross, God transferred your sin. And God substituted your sin and my sin because of Jesus Christ. Oh, the old preacher Charles Spurgeon says this, Behold the person of the suffering substitute that Christ has once suffered for sins, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God. And he continues to say, the substitute was of a complex nature, that he was truly man on one side, but also truly God on the other side which also brings to mind that if he was truly man, he understands your pain. He understands your inadequacies. He understands my pain. He understands my inadequacies. But also on the other side, if he's truly God, then he has the power to overcome that which he understands about you and about me. Jesus Christ came as a perfect, as a precious, and as a pure substitute for the sin of man. For the giving for eternity to take effect. Number one, people of God. Jesus came as a substitute for our sins. But number two, Jesus came as a sacrifice for our sins. Sacrifice in our context today is to give up something or some things for the sake of someone else. Sometimes to go through pain, to give up some justified rights and privileges for the sake of someone else. And this Jesus did so that, yes, we can be reconciled back to God in an attempt to appease God after the sin of Adam and Eve. Man came up with alternatives, and that's why when you go to the Old Testament, there were sacrifices and offerings for nearly everything. But because, again, they were not perfect, because they were not pure, because they were not precious, they had to continue day in, day out. But because Jesus Christ is the perfect sacrifice, he did it once and for all. There are many alternatives that they had. So the Old Testament, as I say, had quite a number of sacrifices to be offered to try and make amends with God. The sacrifices were done repeatedly, day in, day out. All human efforts cannot make up for man's ultimate and deep need for God. Some of our efforts today, because man is the same, whether in the yester years, whether today. And you will still find that even today we sometimes may have alternatives. And those alternatives could be trying to be religious today. Those alternatives could be trying to be going to church every Sunday and even on a day like this. To be found in the fellowship. Sometimes, let me tell you, to be found at the heart of service 
if we are not careful and the substitution has not happened, Isaiah will write and will tell us, all our righteous acts, they are like filthy rags before the Lord. Unless, unless this sacrifice. So today they have not stopped. Or sometimes can even be giving offerings. And all those things are not necessarily bad. But we need to go like the Macedonian church was told by Paul. That they first gave themselves to God. And when they gave themselves to God, everything above them followed, including all their resources. But we cannot be in a place that we are going to church. And as a beautiful church, and as a good church, as Nairobi Baptist Church, relax, hoping that our salvation will come. It doesn't happen. We cannot be giving, and giving is not necessarily bad, and coming to church is not necessarily bad. And think that, yes, I am okay with God. It cannot be in any other relationship unless it is in this sacrifice. Day after day, Hebrews tells us, every priest stands and performs his religious duties. Again and again, he offers the same sacrifices, which can never take away sin. And then he says this, but when this priest had offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, he sat down at the right hand side of God. When Jesus Christ offered for all time one sacrifice for sins, it was finished. The ultimate grace of God for the giving for eternity to take effect, wonderful people of God. There must be a substitute. And Jesus Christ came as a substitute. For giving for eternity to take effect. Jesus Christ came as a sacrifice. And I say it once again. He came as a pure sacrifice. As a precious sacrifice. And a perfect sacrifice. By dying in our place for our sins, Jesus Christ removed the wrath of God that we justly deserved. In fact, it goes even further. A propitiation is not simply a sacrifice that removes the wrath, but a sacrifice that removes the wrath and turns that wrath into favor. So that we can, yes, be called the children of God. All by his grace. Jesus sacrificed his privileges. Listen to what Philippians says. Paul writing to the Philippians. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interest of others. Your attitude should be the same as that of Christ Jesus who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in an appearance as a man. He humbled himself and became obedient to the death, even death on a cross. And it's upon that that the Bible says that therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name. And that at that name, that is a perfect sacrifice, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth. And every tongue confess that indeed Jesus Christ is Lord. Jesus was crucified and he died a painful death. Sacrifice. It is that painful death that we remember today. By believing in him, we have reconciliation. We have peace with God. And by the grace of God, that peace of God, when we understand it in its holistic nature, by his grace also gives us and leaves us at a place of rest 
with mankind and with the creation of God. Once again, for giving for eternity to take effect, number one, God gave Jesus Christ his son to come as a substitute. Number two, he gave Jesus Christ his son to come as a sacrifice for our sins. And number three, he gave his one and only son to come as a savior for mankind. Now, the basic understanding of the word savior or salvation or to be saved primarily means to be rescued. And to be rescued normally comes with the understanding that you are being helped from something that you cannot help yourself. That I'm being helped from something that is so much overwhelming that if, however much I try, I will just go around in circles. So it is to be rescued from what we cannot rescue ourselves from. For example, if you are maybe just walking, 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 and somehow you didn't know, and you find yourself in a ditch that is so deep, in this pit that is so deep, all you can do is to shout, help, help, help. Is there someone out there? Help, help, help. Because we cannot come out ourselves. And sometimes we find ourselves in this ditch because we were just walking and mistakenly we found ourselves there. Sometimes we find ourselves there because we take ourselves there. And when we are just walking naturally, what just basically that means is that naturally we are born sinners. And so we are constantly in the ditch. Unless that substitute and that sacrifice comes to get us out of that ditch. And because we are born sinners, there are things that sometimes we do that always lead us into that pit. That all we can do is to shout help, help, help. And sometimes it can even be that yes, the natural way we find ourselves there. And because we are born sinners, we constantly take ourselves there. The bottom line is that when we are in a pit, and therefore we will need someone stronger and someone who has the ability to rescue. And that is why God saw that we are trying to come we are trying to come out. We are trying to raise our hands. Maybe people are even throwing ropes so that we can come up. But the rope sometimes may be cut. Or the rope is so slippery that we cannot. And God saw that predicament. And that is why he sent his son, Jesus Christ. Jesus did exactly that. To save you and to save me and to save the world and to save mankind. And that is what you find in verse 16 and following. First John 4.13 says, We know that we live in him and he in us because he has given us. Because he has given us of his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Soon after the resurrection of Jesus Christ and after his ascension, the disciples were facing serious persecution. And it's in one of those circumstances in Acts chapter 5 that Peter and the other apostles they say, we must obey God rather than man. The God of our fathers raised Jesus from the dead, whom you had killed by hanging him on a tree. 
God exalted him to his own right hand as prince and as savior that he might give repentance and forgiveness of sins to Israel. And I want to add to the children of God. And they continue to say, we are witnesses of these things. And so is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. They were primarily saying that we had seen this. We have been with Jesus. We have walked with him. And so we know for sure that Jesus Christ came as the savior of the world. And that is why at this point you find it from verse 17 to 18. And it says, For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Verse 18, whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe stands condemned already because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only son. That believing there, again, takes us to substitute. You believe in what he did for you, what he did for me on the cross. And that is what brings salvation. And I want to tell us this, this morning. That Jesus came as a savior for the world. That primarily means as human beings, Jesus Christ came. And so that we might be called the children of God. And that happens by believing in him. But because Jesus also has the power, because he's talking about he serving the world, because he has the power when the children of God are saved, then by the grace of God, we can also bring redemption to this world. That Jesus Christ can come into cultures and Jesus Christ can save the cultures. Cultures that are sometimes contrary to the teachings of God. So my prayer for you and for myself is that even as we remember this season, knowing that he came as a substitute, that he came as a sacrifice and he came to save us, that we have made that choice so that your sins and my sins are substituted. But also when the world accepts Jesus Christ, Jesus saves the world from the systems of the world. This world that we live in today, oh, look at the issues of morality. The morals are being turned upside down. Where Jesus Christ is, Jesus can save. The world, including issues of morality. Look at war and greed that is in human nature. This country fighting against that, this fighting against that, and sometimes when it's not even country, when you bring it to our cultures, it is this party against that party. And I want us to know that when Jesus Christ came and when we accept him as a people, God can change countries. God can save countries. God can save cultures. Even the parties that we have, God can save them. But the people must be genuinely, genuinely, and mark my words, genuinely be a people that are professing Jesus Christ as a substitute and as a sacrifice. So that it's not a lip service. When the world accepts him, the world is changed. And that is the salvation that we are talking about. Giving for eternity. For that to take effect once again, people of God. Jesus Christ was given as a substitute for our sins. Jesus Christ was given as a sacrifice for our sin. Jesus Christ was given as a savior for mankind. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son so that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. 
So God gave. He gave his son. He gave his one and only son as a substitute, as a sacrifice, and as a savior. In the year 1858, a lady by the name Francesca Ridley Heivgal visited Germany with her father who was being treated for an eye problem and worshipped him. You can start coming. While in a pastor's home, she saw a painting of the crucifixion with words under it that said, I did this for thee. What hast thou done for me? Quickly she took a piece of paper and wrote a poem based on those words, I did this for thee. However, she was not satisfied with it. So she threw that piece of paper into the fireplace. The paper somehow was not burnt. So her father encouraged her to publish it. Later on, the famous songwriter and composer, Philip Bliss, put music to the world. And today, people sing around the world that song. I gave my life for thee. My precious blood I shed that thou might be ransomed. And quickened from the dead, I gave, I gave my life for thee. What hast thou given for me? And all that is asking is that we give ourselves back to him and to believe in him. We too can give. We can give of our time to God. We can give of our talents to God. We can give of our treasures to God. But ultimately, we must give our hearts to God. When we do, God uses that which we have given to him to affect humanity for the sake of eternity. So wonderful people of God, giving for eternity was as a result of a substitute for our sins. As a sacrifice for our sins. And Jesus Christ as a savior for mankind. Jesus, keep me near the cross. There a precious fountain. Free to all a healing stream flows from Calvary mountain. In the cross, in the cross, be my glory ever. And from the cross by ransom soul, rest beyond the reef. And Jesus, keep me near the cross.
cross, near the cross, I will watch and wait. Near the cross, I'll watch and wait. Oh, we trust together. Till I see my Savior's face in His breath. eternity and he gave his best his only begotten son who came as a substitute for you and as a substitute for me who came as a sacrifice for you and as a sacrifice for me and the entire world who came as a savior the savior of the world the word of that song that was written by Francesca Ridley have gone what have you what have I what have we given to him ultimately his desire is that he will have our hearts and that will be totally sold out but I also said that as he comes, he saves our hearts and our souls. But he also saves us from the evils of this world. So I don't know if you are here. And I may not ask you to stand or do anything. Could it be that there is something in this illustration of the pit that I was talking about, that you are there and you are trying to hold a rope that has been thrown to you by man. Oh, but the rope is so slippery. You keep sliding and falling down. Boom! To the pit. For you and for us to come out, Jesus only came as a substitute. I have tested him and I know. Could it be that you are struggling with something and maybe the place to begin is to surrender the heart. And just in case you are there, tell him, Lord Jesus, I come to you. I accept that I am a sinner born and a sinner as a result of the sin of Adam and Eve. I have tried all sorts of religiosity, all sorts of sacrifices or offerings if you prefer, but I keep going round in circle. Lord, I ask you to come into my life to make me your child and to turn around my life. But also if there is something that is really pulling you down all the time. I said I'll, I'll give you time to pray. Bring it before the Lord. Father, those that have surrendered an aspect of life to you. The testimony that we have is you came to save the world. You came to save us holistically. So will you rescue us? Will you rescue someone today? 
on this good Friday, this Easter weekend. My prayer is that as the apostles said that we have a testimony, someone here will say, I have a testimony. So wonderful people of God, he came as a substitute. He came as a sacrifice and as a savior of mankind. Receive him and let your life be changed. In the name of God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we all say it. Thank you.